good morning everyone uh, this is dr nitin in my today's video i'm going to talk about the landmark studies in periodontics uh, before that if you're not subscribed to my channel subscribe to my channel for further informative videos so without further ado let's get into the video first we should understand what a landmark study is only having a lot number of citation doesn't make a study a landmark study a landmark study must have the following important things a landmark study is a study which challenges the already existing paradigm which changes the way we think second the landmark study advanced our knowledge for example dental plaque initiated gingivitis this was a new concept in 1965 and removal of this plaque reversed this inflammation and third it influenced our thinking guided tissue re regeneration gives predictable regeneration definitely influenced our thinking and the last is it changed the entire clinical practice of periodontology and the best example for this is implants first we are going to see the landmark study on etiology of periodontitis the most often cited papers in periodontology are those by Harold Low and John Silnes in which they described the criteria for the gingival index and plaque index it was cited 4161 times and 4368 times after describing the gingival index and plaque index in the 6364 paper low and his colleagues used these clinical assessment in a classic series of studies on experimental gingivitis in which the etiological link between the dental plaque and gingivitis was firmly established and this happened in 1965 so after this study periodontal disease became established as an infectious disease and in turn affected most aspects of clinical periodontology the next paradigm shifting study is on diagnostic aids that is probing sigurd ramford's description of how to use a calibrated periodontal probe to conduct a periodontal examination in which a site specific probing depth and clinical attachment loss could be measured was another influential paper he also advocated the use of the cemento enamel junction as a fixed reference point to determine the severity or the amount of damage the next landmark study is on how deep is too deep to treat whether non surgically or surgically Linde et al and Sokransky et al in 1982 developed the concept of critical probing depth a way for decision making the critical probing depth for non surgical therapy that is for scaling and root planing is 2.9 mm this means that below this probing depth the site would lose clinical attachment as a result of therapy while above this value attachment gain will result same way for access flap therapy the critical probing depth is 4.2 mm again this means that open flap debridement is only beneficial above this value while if you do open flap debridement below this value attachment loss will occur the next study is one of the most famous studies on the natural history of periodontal disease in man yes i'm talking about the sri lankan tea plantation study which was done by low and anard in 1986 a very wide range of patients were selected from the age of 14 to 46 years old these patients were never exposed to any therapeutic intervention that is dental treatment nor thought any oral hygiene measures they were longitudinally observed for 15 years and were divided into three groups the first group which contained 8% of the total population had rapid progression of periodontal disease the second group which comprised of 11% of the total population exhibited no progression of periodontal disease beyond gingivitis and the third group between the two extremes in which 81% had moderate progression this study confirmed that one gingivitis does not always progress to periodontitis and the second some cases of periodontitis progress slowly and the third in other situation loss of attachment may occur in rapid episodic burst so the conclusion was based on rates of progression there are multiple forms of periodontitis next we are coming to the landmark studies on classifications before 1920s periodontal disease were categorized based on their clinical features and hypothetical causes In the early part of the 20th century that is in 1946 Gottlieb 
he called the current concept of periodontitis as periodontoclasia and he grouped these periodontoclasia into three categories that is inflammatory degenerative and periodontal trauma that is occlusal trauma immediately in 1952 glickman proposed periodontosis he proposed that periodontosis is a degenerative and a non inflammatory destruction of the periodontium in 1976 it was convincingly shown that periodontosis was actually an infection and not a degenerative disease this study was done by newman and sokransky in 1976 on the studies on the microbiology of periodontosis finally in 1989 the term periodontosis was abandoned and officially replaced by what we call now as periodontitis this was changed in the american academy of periodontology consensus report by nevins becker and common in the proceedings of the world workshop in clinical periodontics chicago in 1989 they also included the term localized juvenile periodontitis as a sub classification of periodontitis 10 years later in 1999 armitage et al divided the periodontal disease and condition into two that is chronic and aggressive periodontitis he further renamed localized juvenile periodontitis as localized aggressive periodontitis a new classification scheme for periodontal and periimplant diseases introduced key changes from the 1999 classification this workshop was spearheaded by jack catton gary armitage ian chapel Kenneth Corman and Brian Mealy et al. They decided to simplify the Armitage classification. Armitage's classification had two categories: chronic periodontitis and aggressive periodontitis. Catton's new classification simplified it by adding three categories. Under the subcategory periodontitis, it was furthermore divided according to the stages and gradings. One of the key points which was put forth in this new classification scheme of periodontal and periimplant disease and condition was that key gingivitis is considered reversible but once a patient has periodontitis they have this diagnosis for life just like diabetes and hypertension that is lifelong maintenance of successfully treated patient is essential now we'll see a few landmark studies on pathogenesis of periodontitis Sokransky and Hafaji et al paper on microbial etiological agents of destructive periodontal disease in 1994 they spoke about how bacteria play a critical role in the pathogenesis of periodontal disease it was a highly cited paper uh, cited 1171 times in 2002 Sokransky and Hafaji published a paper on dental biofilms difficult therapeutic targets in this they talked about microorganism organizing into a community that is a biofilm which have certain advantages and are not easily eliminated and then there is the consensus report periodontal diseases on pathogenesis and microbial factors in 1996 this consensus report comprised of an extract from the sokransky's paper on the criteria for the infectious agents in dental caries and periodontal diseases published in 1979 this had sokransky's criteria this criteria was a modification of the koch's criteria koch had given certain criteria to identified whether this is the causative agent for this particular disease sokransky has modified it for oral diseases oral pathogens this 1979 paper has sparked hundreds of studies all over the world and ultimately led to a deeper understanding of the highly complex human oral microbiome In honorable mention we are going to talk about the work of Slots and Marsh on pathogens and biofilms. Sokransky's work was broad based on bacteria. What Slot did was on isolated bacteria that is of Actinobacillus, Actinomycetes, Comitans, Capnocytophaga species. Marsh et al's work and study is mainly based on dental plaque, biofilm and its significance in health and diseases. Pathogenesis of periodontitis is modulated by various factors including local host and environmental factors. Jenko et al and Grossi et al did a very good study on risk factors of periodontal diseases. Grossi et al paper on risk indicators for attachment loss was a highly cited paper. From their paper we move on to smoking. Is smoking a risk factor? 
So if you search paper for smoking, Kinani DF et al's paper on the effect of smoking on mechanical and antimicrobial periodontal therapy is the most cited paper for smoking. What about stress? Jenko and Grossi's paper on relationship of stress, distress and inadequate coping behavior to periodontal disease was the most cited paper. Linden's paper on stress and the progression of periodontal disease in 1996 also has a very very significant contribution. Saley's concept of HPA axis in 1967, all these stress papers are based on this concept. There is no still conclusive evidence that stopping stress has an effect on periodontitis. Now we come to genetics, role of gene polymorphism in periodontitis. A lot of research has been done on genetics. Kinani's paper on gene and gene polymorphism associated with periodontal disease. Kahneman study on interleukin 1 gene and of course the famous twin studies of Mitchell Lewis. The twin studies were in 1994, genetic and heritable risk in periodontal disease. The second study in the twin study was the periodontal findings in adult twins, which was published in 1991. In this study, it states that monozygotic twins have more gingivitis score than dizygotic twins. Now we come to periodontal medicine. Probably the most often quoted early paper in 1989 is by Kimo Metella et al who found the association between poor dental health and coronary heart disease was independent of other confounders such as age, total cholesterol, high density lipoprotein, presence of diabetes, hypertension and smoking. This, is, this paper is definitely a landmark paper just because this was the pioneer in showing that dental health, oral health is directly related to the systemic diseases. In 1993, Frank Di Stefano described periodontal disease as an independent risk factor in the US population, thus supporting the findings of Metella in Europe. He was also the first person to describe the biological mechanism which is involved in triggering of the cardiovascular disease because of periodontal conditions. Next we move on to diabetes and periodontitis, the bidirectional relationship. The 1993 paper of Lowe, periodontal disease, the sixth complication of diabetes, showed the direct relationship between periodontal therapy and diabetes. In this paper, he did meta-analysis which indicated that the HbA1c reduction of around 0.4% can be anticipated following effective periodontal therapy. 2011 paper of pressure established that periodontitis and diabetes has a two-way relationship that is periodontal therapy can help glycemic control same way glycemic control can help reduce periodontitis. Now we come to the study of Offenbacher. Offenbacher explored the ability of infection with oral organisms to induce obstetric complication in pregnancy. In his paper, he says that oral organisms like Porphyromonas gingivalis and Campylobacter rectus were capable of eliciting a wide range of obstetric complication including fetal growth restriction, placental damage and early parturition. Hence, oral infection in humans could lead to increased risk of preterm low birth weight deliveries. The paper was published in 1996. Now we come to the studies in management of periodontitis. In 1869, Rix J.W. et al. first publicly described a new treatment for the cure of inflammation of the gum that is thorough curating. He was the first known instance of the non-surgical removal of the acquired deposits. After Rix, it was Zinner in 1955 showed that ultrasound that is ultrasonic could be used to remove deposits from the teeth. Zinner et al. stated that these ultrasonic instruments were equally effective in removal calculus as that of hand scalers. In 1983, Eshveria B and Kafis et al. challenged the value of gingival curettage and concluded that gingival curettage did not improve the condition of the periodontal tissue more significantly than scaling and root planning. They did a biometric evaluation after one month of gingival curettage and they said after scaling and root planning, gingival curettage of shallow suprabonic pockets does not predictably improve the health of the periodontal tissue. Gingival curettage is not necessary in routine treatment of shallow supraboni pockets. 
the concept of host modulation was introduced by Golib for local delivery to the periodontal pocket of sub-antimicrobial dose of doxycycline to suppress collagenase activity in the periodontal pocket and tissue breakdown. This was published in 1998. In his paper, he also described that tetracyclines inhibit connective tissue breakdown by multiple non-antimicrobial mechanisms. Melcher in 1976 on the Journal of Periodontology talked about the repair potentials of periodontal tissues. He talked about the cells of the periodontium and their role in the healing of the wounds. This was the basic concept for guided tissue regeneration. Based on Melcher's concept of cells populating the healing wound, Iman et al. provided proof of concept by introducing guided tissue regeneration, a barrier membrane to prevent the migration of cells downwards. New cementum with inserting principal fibers had formed on the previously diseased root surface. This finding suggests that new attachment can be achieved by cells originating from the periodontal ligament. Thus, this paper from Nyman and Linde in 1982 was a game changer. We come to study in related to perioplastic surgery. Langer and Langer study in 1985 on connective tissue grafts shattered a long-held principle that denuded root surface could not be covered predictably with soft tissue graft. It was published in 1985. The study of Langer and Langer is definitely a landmark study because connective tissue graft still remains the gold standard for root coverage procedures. Next landmark study is on of course implants. The 1989 study by Adel, Erickson, Leckholm and Brainmark on the long-term follow-up of osseointegrated implants in the treatment of totally edentulous jaw was a very significant study. This was a 15-year-old study. The 1986 study by Albertson, Zab, Worthington and Erickson on the long-term efficacy of the currently used dental implants was very important to get to know about the survival life of the implants. Thus, Edel and Albertson provided proof that osseointegrated implants can survive in the oral cavity for a long time, just like natural teeth. So, if you'd like this video, like and share this video, and do subscribe to my channel for further informative videos.